Hey, this is Mark Wahlberg. You're watching Real Black. Don't change that dial. God bless you. Lights, camera, action, it's on. New black film revolution born. Hoover shakers, big and little filmmakers. Let's make a movie today, see where it take us. Halle Berry, Denzel, and Jamie. Terrence Star with Mike D and Spike Lee. Brand new filmmaker born every day. Put a camera in his hand and let him lead the way. Let me get an Oscar. Let me get a hey, I'm Robert X. Goffin, standing across the street from the Four Seasons Hotel. We're about to chat with Academy Award winning actor Cuba Gooding Jr. Don't go anywhere. Let's go inside. I kind of like being misunderstood a little bit because I think if everybody knows exactly where I'm coming from, it's boring to watch, you know? Back in the day, you used to have the studio heads not allowing any cameras to be shown when people are on vacation, and now you, you, know, you get guys on the toilet and there's a camera picture of her eating food in a restaurant. So it's my job to stay as mysterious and misunderstood as possible until it's time for you to get lost in the character. I'm here with Academy Award winning actor Cuba Gooding Jr. Thank you for joining us. Right what brings you to the city of brotherly love? Uh, <laughs> any, any chance I can get. Uh, but I'm here for uh, a movie Daddy Day Camp. Daddy Day Camp was hilarious, I saw the film. Yeah, uh, when you were offered the role, did you ever consider the fact that the young talent would upstage you? Oh, they say don't work with children or animals, and uh, there's a reason for that, you know. But we had good kids, I mean, and when they got together, their chemistry was fantastic. And what attracted you to the role of Charlie? Well, you know, it was, it was in the script. It had a lot of heart to it. You know, there was themes of uh, families coming together. My uh, character, Charlie, started this camp to be with his son, because his son wanted to go off to camp, and he wanted to spend the summer with him. And in the process, in the chaos that ensues, he has to call in a favor with his own father. Mm -hmm. And that relationship had soured, so, so they're brought back together. And uh, I think it's important, especially when you're dealing with family films, to have themes of uh, teamwork and togetherness like we, we have it in our movie. And I, uh, I think kids need to see that. You know? It's kind of funny, some number of years ago, you were a kid getting his hair cut yeah. by Eddie Murphy That's right. and coming to America. And, uh, he originated the role, right. Charlie. He did. And Daddy Daycare. Did it, did it cross your mind that you'd be filling in his shoes or following in his No. When, when I read the script, it really felt like a, a reconceptualization of the, the, the franchise, you know. The joke that we had on the set that is, this movie does well, we should do a sequel and call it Daddy Day Camp 2. Because it's, you know, there's none of the original cast uh, from the original movie. And, and, you know, I'm a huge fan of Eddie's, but if I tried to duplicate his performance, it'd be a waste of time. So um, I, it really feels like, you know, a different uh, movie. The motivations are different, you know, for him to reconnect with his son, you know. And, uh, and then all the kids, all the other kids in the cast are all new, unknown kids that we found that just are really, really magical. I think people are really going to connect with them. It's a brand new experience. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I, I've never done a sequel to any of my movies, so I wasn't looking, you know, to do a sequel, so to speak, you know. But, you know, there it is. Let the people judge. And in your career, you have chosen a diverse range of characters. Uh, you played a hitman in Shadowboxer, which right. was filmed here. What, um, what steps do you take when, when deciding a role? Tell me about that film, too. Well, you know, in Shadowboxer's instance, that script came to me by Lee Daniels, and I just thought the, the characters, the relationships and, with the characters and the different uh, um, interracial relationships and the sexuality of it really blew me away, and I thought it made a powerful statement, so that's why I felt it was important to get involved in that. And I just, I go from each script, and I try to find something that I can connect with as far as what they're asking me to do in the movie. And then, what's the statement the movie's making, you know? And the older you get, the more your philosophy changes. It's all about working, you know? If I was a guitarist, I could sit in a room all day and get perfect at it. Or if I was a painter, I could paint, you know, a bunch of paintings and then pick the best one. But as an actor, you have to be invited to practice, you know, especially a film actor. You know, to set up the cameras and the lights and everything, you have to be invited to do that. So the best way to get good at your craft is to work. You know, because not all my movies uh, have found their mark, so to speak, you know. But, but I've learned something from every one of them. 
And our show was about the new black film movement, about um, highlighting African Americans or minorities in the arts. Right. Uh, you are a pioneer because you, in this era, won an Academy Award, which is now it seems becoming a little more commonplace for, right. for, for us. And I'm an actor myself. So, okay. Um, what do you have to say to all the talented young actors out there who one day dream of following in your footsteps as it pertains to getting that gold statue in their hand? You know, you just have to do you. You know what I mean? Do the best work that you can do and focus in um, creating better opportunities for yourself by, by, um, by focusing on your craft. And then all the accolades and all that other stuff will fall into place. You know, a lot of times kids want to achieve what the other kid has, but you have to be confident in your space first before you can step into the next space. And, um, and never take no for an answer, you know. I, I was told a lot of times that when I smiled at the beginning of my career, the wrinkles made me look too old. I'll never, oh, you'll never be, you'll never make it. So I just smiled and kept doing my thing, and pretty soon it clicked. Now, a lot of actors feel like they can't get the work that they need, especially minority actors. And yeah. So they decide to develop projects for themselves. Right. Is that on the horizon? Oh, you? absolutely. I'm starring in a movie with uh, Spencer Breslin, this thing called Harold that I produced. We start filming that next month. Um, yeah, absolutely. I have another screenplay in development that I've been working on for over a little over a year now um, that we just secured financing on. Um, so yeah, absolutely. You have to, you can't also in that respect sit back and wait for opportunity. You have to create. My career, it's a painting and you'll see certain colors, but it might not be, you know, I might start off with a blue and then add a little red and get to fuchsia, you know. So you just gotta, you know, the, the people that have appreciated the work just know that there's a lot more work coming. And there's a lot more looks, big looks, big things happening. And, uh, and that's all I can ask for. Right now, you're probably wondering, what exactly is Real Black? Real Black is a Philadelphia-based production company dedicated to promoting African-American film. In addition to this show, we also host two film screenings per month here in the city. You can check out our website to join our mailing list or look for our full page ad each month in Rolling Out Weekly. I come back every year I get newer. I'm the dust on the moon. I'm the trash in the sewer. Let's go. I come back every year I get brighter. If you think thinking hip hop is alive, hold up your lighter. Today we are here with no other than hip hop legend KRS One. One of the greatest MCs of all time, but I want to get one straight, one thing straight with you, Chris. Are you the greatest MC of all time, or one of the greatest MCs of all time, in your opinion? I go ahead and say the. Yeah, I go ahead and say that. In the spirit of Muhammad Ali, I, I say the. So, tell us about your new album that we have that you have coming out right now. I know I got in trouble for that one. Um, new album, Hip Hop Lives. It's a celebration. Uh, it's 20 years of Boogie Down Productions, 1987 to 2007. Uh, those that know the history know that I started with Molly Mall, MC Shan. I answered MC Shan's Queensbridge. Molly Mall was the producer and DJ at the time. For 20 years, it's been in hip hop's mythology or folklore that we were rivals. And so on the 20th anniversary, it was only right, it, it, it was only karmically right to reach out to Molly and say, man, do this, the, the 20th anniversary album. I had to battle it took 20 years to get Molly in the studio. And on top of that, we grabbed the title, not necessarily off of Nas's Hip Hop Is Dead, but we developed that title by uh, uh, talking about James Brown passing on Christmas Day. Me and Molly started looking at that like, wow, this is crazy. James Brown passing on Christmas Day. Hip Hop lives. Nas had already put out Hip Hop Is Dead. And me and him had a, 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 a deep discussion about hip hop being dead. And a lot of people, you know, just looked at the title of Nas's album, Hip Hop Is Dead, and just said, oh man, Nas is declaring it dead. 
But when you listen to the album, even the last song is saying, live hip hop, live, stay hip hop, stay. He's actually crying out for hip hop to expand, to go beyond the superficial and into something with more depth. So our album is more like a follow up, a part two, if it has to be compared at all. It's sort of a part two, a follow up, hip hop lives. We are resurrected. In your song, Hip Hop Lives, you have a verse that says, every year I get newer, I'm the dust on the moon, I'm the trash in the sewer. So explain to the audience like the relevance and the message you're trying to convey in that verse. It's funny you picked that verse out of all verses. I'm trying to say that hip hop lives. I'm the dust on the moon, meaning I'm star stuff. You know what it is? I can walk up to you and say, peace, God, or what up, my nigga? the controversial N-word. When we realize that hip hop is all of it, hip hop is high scholarship and the lowest base ignorance you can possibly imagine. I'm the dust on the moon, I'm the trash in the sewer. And the middle part is I come back every year I get newer. I'm the dust on the moon, I'm, I'm all of it. Don't just look at me as a conscious rapper or a gangster rapper or a pimp or a this or a that. I'm all of it. When you say hip hop, we are all of it. All of it plays a role. All of it makes everything else relevant. KRS-One would not be relevant if it wasn't for Snoop Dogg. We gotta think about the children we bringing up. Because everyone would say, okay, that's just regular KRS. I would be the norm and that would be that. But because there is a young Jeezy and a T.I. and a Snoop and all the gangsters and pimps that are out there doing their thing and bless their souls, KRS-One is able to shine. And so are they because the audience gets diversity. They're getting to see, imagine, right. the same culture that produces Little Kim produces Lauren Hill. Okay. What a culture to be in. I mean, this is the coolest movement on earth. But it's been here over and over again. You know, this is the hippie movement again. That's what hip hop is. This is the jazz movement. This is the gospel movement. This is it all over again. Hey, give me another question. I just want to transition a little bit. In your opinion, what is the state of black film? Black film? Black film. Uh, I think, well, without degrading anyone's work, um, <laughs> I will put that disclaimer on it first. Um, I will say, though, that um, me personally, I'd like to see more, you know, films of, I, I, I don't want to say films with depth, because everybody feels that their, their film has depth. But um, can we be brave about certain issues? You know, here's some black films I'd like to see. I'd like to see the um, African-American, I'd like to see African-American history retold. Okay. Like just, like the way Roots, you know, Alex Haley did a phenomenal job with the book Roots, and then the television series was just crazy. That's a classic. Can we do that again? You know, can we do it again? And okay, uh, uh, with the with a uh, maybe with a, 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 a turn up the light on free blacks and their perspective and slave owning blacks during slavery and their perspective. Can we get the African American story to be told again? You know, something else to look at. Um, like Moses and the Ten Commandments with Charleston Heston, you know, the classic. I mean, Cecil B. DeMills is not to be tested on this. He is the man. But can we get an African-American Moses story? Something that has, with the epic and the depth, not just we want to show you black folk as Moses, but real scholarship and depth that others did not discuss and go to. You know, in terms of black film, okay, we've done the relationship thing. We, we've, we've done that out completely. Why aren't African Americans cornering the hip hop market in terms of films? Like, I mean, cornering the market. Like, why does it take, you know, Eminem 
put out the last great hip hop film, Eight Mile. That was a great hip hop film. Right. You know, it was a great hip hop film. Where's the others? For the past 35 summers, the Robin Hood Dell has been a North Philadelphia mainstay, consistently bringing some of the top names in jazz, R&B, and gospel to the city for a series of affordable concerts under the stars. The Dell East is a Philadelphia tradition. When you think of the many great artists who have graced the stages from Tina Marie, Phyllis Hyman, Freddie Jackson, Temptations, Parliament, Patti LaBelle, great artists, The Whispers, Gladys Knight, Frankie Beverly and Mays, The OJs, you could go on and on. Real musicians! Real singing on this stage tonight! I think that we should keep the Dell open so that we can have black entertainers perform here and Robin Thicke if he wants to. You know, it's not just a black thing, it's an everything thing. It's people who want to hear music, great music, so let's keep the Dell open. I've been here for the last couple of years, and this is one place that I've been that black people get together and there's no trouble. We old this school. Is such a yes. <laughs> I'm here all the time at the Dell. Now I've been coming to the Dell, oh my God, I can't remember how long. I've been coming to the Dell for at least 15 years now. You can get to see a live show for only $24. That's the highest price ticket. It's Philadelphia. It's homegrown. It's like home. you get home folks here. And you have pretty good seats wherever you sit at. And it's just a nice atmosphere. I think it's a Philadelphia tradition. Been around for years. You know, it's, it's well known. You know, people come sit on the lawn. It's an institution here. I've been doing these shows since the 80s, and it's in our hood. It's in our community, and that's what makes the Dell special. Last time I played here was in 91. We opened for Frankie Beverly and Mays. That's been, so it's been a long time since I've been here. And tonight was just a lot of fun. I don't care what they say about you. It's warm feeling and it feels like home, you know, and people are pretty much up close and just love the outdoor feeling, you know, the, the being outdoors. Nice. There's a certain unique quality about the offering of a concert series within the context of something that municipal government is doing with citizens. Our tagline is the Urban Contemporary People's Venue. The Delis itself has a very venerable history. Uh, it, it opened as a venue as the Robin Hood Dell back in the early 1930s, I believe about 1931 or 32, as a summer home of uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra, and that was their summer home exclusively until the the venue we now know as the Mann Music Center or the Mann Center for, for Performing Arts came online in 1972. We have posters in the back that had tickets for Nancy Wilson and, Count, and the Count Basie Orchestra for $2 a ticket. Now our highest price ticket is $24, so we're still trying to provide quality entertainment for those that always can't afford to go see a, a good concert. We have a variety of great R&B acts throughout the rest of the summer. Here you will see Freddie Jackson, Kindred the Family Soul, Regina Bell, uh, Jaguar Wright, or the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, George Clinton, as well as the United We Funk All-Star, which comprises the, the Daz Band, the SOS Band, and Confunction. Uh, we also have Classic Soul with the Dells and uh, Casey and JoJo. So. Uh, a lot of great acts out here this summer. We encourage everybody to come on out. There have been entire generations, if not two, that you know, uh, people have been going. In those 35 years we've been having it, I'm sure at this point that some of the people that started out in terms of the adults and their children, and in some cases probably their grandchildren, have now begun coming to the concerts here at the Delis. We offer this season as one of the shows that we think we're back on track and within urban, con urban contemporary entertainment that we hope that we have returned to our position of giving the people what they want.
giving them what they want at an affordable price. It's a North Village tradition. I used to be out there too. Remember, tickets are still available for all shows, but are going fast. Call 215-685-9560 for more information. For me, there's always a balance in, in being a responsible artist activist or responsible human being in society today. I always have to weigh my artistic choices with their societal relevance. Richard, Marcus Cooper is married. Tied the knot till death do you part. Mm -hmm. Something strange about that? No, just not the Richie I knew. People change. Hmm. You happily married? Yeah, I'm, I'm happily married. No, you're not. You didn't say it right. I try not to let my politics limit me artistically and, you know, say like, well, I can't do that because I don't ever want to play a black prostitute or I can't do that because I don't ever want to play, you know, a drug addict. I, I really try not to do that. What's important to me is to make sure that my characters ring true, that they reflect a trueness to society. Because if I can bring out the true humanity of a character, then I'm not perpetuating a stereotype. I'm actually revealing a truth. I Think I Love My Wife is a new film that's written and directed and produced and starring Chris Rock. <laughs> I'm just acting in it. And um, it is a remake of Eric Romare's 1974 film called Chloe in the Afternoon. It's basically the story of a middle-aged man who's got it all. He's got a house in the suburbs and a beautiful wife and two gorgeous kids and you know a great career and he's really bored and into his life walks an old flame um, and a, an old party girl that he's known and she kind of tries to entangle him in her web of seduction <laughs> and that's my character Nikki True. <laughs> Acting was really kind of like an after-school activity um, and it was just something that really stuck. I really, I've always felt really at home on stage and in acting. I've always felt a real peace and fulfillment from creating these other people and bringing humanity to these other characters. And, um, you know, I did some television work when I was in high school, like I was in an after school special and on a soap opera. And then after college, I did my first feature, which was called Our Song. It was an independent film that was at Sundance. Around the t same time, my first studio film was in theaters, and that was Save the Last Dance. And then came lots of other films, um, Lift and Bad Company, which was actually the first time that I worked with Chris Rock, uh, United States of Leland, and Against the Ropes, and Ray, and um, Last King of Scotland, and uh, now this. I think I love my wife. So do I know your wife? I don't think so. Is she white? No. Well, why, why would you ask that? <laughs> Don't get offended. Remember that girl you brought to Andre's party? It was one girl <laughs> at one party. I, I go out with one white girl, all, all of a sudden I'm Prince. Playing Nikki was, was one of the hardest roles I've ever had to play. I mean, she was really fun on some days, but I also found her really exhausting. You know, because when I read her, I think the reason I was drawn to this character is because it's really easy to think of the other woman as a stereotype or to see Nikki's character as that kind of traditional or stereotypical over-sexualized black woman, you know, and I really wanted to make sure that she was a three-dimensional human being that had psychological difficulties and emotional challenges and reasons for doing the things that she was doing you know, history and conflict within herself and esteem issues. So those were all things that I wanted to layer so that the behavior felt justified to my character. You know, it was, it was a survival tactic. Hi. <laughs> Nikki's an old friend. Uh, what's it been like? Seven, eight years? At least. It's, it's a challenging time to be a woman because there's a lot of pressure to be independent and self-reliant and um, and yet, at the same time, you're taught that you should use your feminine ways and be a woman and be sexy and beautiful and please a man and expect a man to take care of you to an extent. So I think it's a really confusing time and I think she's 
caught in the confusion of that time. You're so nice and clean. <laughs> Comedy for me is, is more like sport than any other, any other kind of acting. You know, it's very much like being on a basketball team. It's definitely a team sport. You feel like everybody's in it to create the right thing and you're constantly passing the ball and giving each other their moment and feeding off of each other. And I, I just, I loved working with the Waynes Brothers. And I was grateful for that experience because that was my first comedy because I was really able to take care of myself as an actor on this film. Like I, it, I felt that I didn't need to worry about the comedy so much and that Chris didn't need to worry about making sure that I was funny because I had kind of wrapped my head around that. and So I could support him more in the drama part of it. And cut. We can fix that. Yeah. yeah, but even that was better than we had That's before. That's a cut. Every director is super different. I mean, you know, working with Chris Rock is totally different from working with Taylor Hackford, is totally different from working with Spike Lee. I mean, they're totally different animals, each of them. I, I was joking with Chris a couple weeks ago, actually, that Chris directed me more in this film than Spike Lee did in She Hate Me because Spike Lee doesn't really direct his actors. He's very much about the tableau of the imagery on screen. And so he has an arduous, casting process where he really tries to make sure that he is casting the right person and the person that will be able to handle it because once you're on set you're kind of free falling. He's not he's not worried about you. He trusts that you are going to do your job as an actor, which is it, it's hard to get used to at first. It's really hard to get used to at first. I remember saying to the studio, you know, how are you going to sell this movie because it's a very unique film. You know, I don't I don't I think there's been a film like this about black people. Maybe she's got to have it. You know, I mean, it's been a long time. And, and they said, we're probably going to objectify the hell out of you. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. <laughs> Which, you know, to an extent for me, if it has a purpose, that's fine. Like this, I think this is a really important film that people need to see. I don't mind, you know, having my butt on the poster because <laughs> it's important that people go see the movie. Hi, I'm Carrie Washington, and you're watching Real Black. Thanks for watching Real Black, and we'll see you in two weeks. We will be here forever. We will still be here forever. Get what I'm saying? Forever. Marley, I come back. Every year I get newer. That's that.